Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our first PIT Dialogue event of the year. My name is Jason Flinsky and I'm coming live to you from um, Collaroy, where uh, the sun has somehow managed to disappear, but we still live in the best one of the best parts of the world. Um, I'm going to ask Steph Evans, who our, is our guest speaker today, to unmute herself and to also put a camera on so that um, people can see her. Um, Mostly, Steph, people ask me to turn my camera off, so you're, <laughs> you're doing very well. I'm so pleased to have you here today, Steph, and thank you for agreeing to speak to us. Thank um, you for Steph, me. Oh, no, not at all. Um, Steph, um, like all great entrepreneurs, started her company at the age of 10, um, which, of course, is called Seas um, of Change, um, and it has the job of educating people about um, climate and climate change and how we can actually do our bit to make the world a better place. Um, when she finished, you finished the HSC last year, is that right? Yeah. And yeah. when I first asked Steph to speak to us, she was sort of saying to me, oh, look, I've got an exam on Thursday. I'm going, are you kidding me? This is your HSC. We'll wait until that's over. Um, uh, but that is kind of how dedicated she is to this cause, which we, we need to see um, more of across the board. Um, Steph was um, voted uh, Young Australian of the Year for the Northern Beaches last year. So I guess you're no longer young anymore, a year on. So sorry to hear about that. Um, but I really um, want us all to um, give a very warm welcome to Steph Evans, um, Young Person of the Year, um, someone changing the world. Um, Steph, uh, give us your best shot. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so you should all be able to see my screen now. Um, so, first of all, thank you so much for coming to listen to me talk about season change and thank you for this opportunity. I am so very excited to share with you my journey and we'll have plenty of times for questions at the end. Um, so first of all, you're probably wondering who am I and what is Seas of Change? So um, I recently graduated from Manly Selective Campus and I am planning to study a double degree in Law and Art with a double major in History and Ancient History. Um, and I'm planning to study that at ANU in Canberra, so I'm moving, packing up and moving in about two weeks. Um, in addition to schooling, I tutor for work and I also run an organization called Seas of Change. So I founded Seas of Change when I was in year when I was 10 years old, I was in year five at Telco North Public School. Um, I had gone through a lot of big life changes and I was a little bit lost, um, but I knew I loved the ocean and I knew I loved animals. So at the time I wanted to be a vet, but no matter how hard I tried, I was way too young. So plan B was TAFE, but I was also too young for that. So plan C was to start a charity. I'm always asked why, and to be honest, I'm not quite sure how that came to mind, but I'm pretty determined. So once I've decided something, I'll make it work. So I then had to decide on a marine animal to focus on. Um, my criteria was an Australian species, but it had to be an animal that didn't receive a lot of funding already. So I ended up doing a Google search and I settled on dugons. From there, I asked my dad to show me how to make a website. I did a lot of research and later in the year launched Save the Dugons. From there, I wrote to plenty of people asking for advice, including a family friend who replied with the typical, you're too young, you can't be trusted with money, get back to me when you're 21. Although this was upsetting, I held my ground and after waiting, I received a response from SeaWorld Australia. This was very, very cool. My parents were so excited and we were all very shocked, um, but they were kind enough to send me four VIP passes as prizes for a competition. I then ran at my school and it kind of just went from there. In high school, I was lucky enough to meet my best friend Mel on day one and halfway through year seven, she became my first team member. Together, we rebranded Seas of Change, ran fundraisers, spoke at our school to raise awareness about um, all of the animals that we were talking about at the time. And I also became an ocean youth ambassador. In year eight, Gloria joined our team and in year nine, Talara joined our team just in time for us to completely rebrand once again. 
I had never ever expected my organization to grow as it has, but as we got older and we continued to educate ourselves, we wanted to expand so that we could raise funds and awareness for other animals and environmental issues as Save the Dugons didn't really encompass um, other animals. So in 2018, we rebranded to Seeds of Change with the aim of raising funds and awareness for a diverse range of issues um, and animals. This included dugons, sea turtles, plastic pollution and climate change. Later in 2018, I was also lucky enough to go on a research trip with Dr. Janet Lanyon in Queensland, who we had been donating funds to so that she could buy equipment for the health checks. It was amazing to see where the funds were going and meet the entire team. And I even got to meet Dr. Chris Brown. The next year, I received a scholarship to attend the Ocean Heroes Boot Camp in Vancouver, Canada. This was the most amazing experience as it's really rare that you find an organization that genuinely wants to support you. Captain Planet Foundation, one of the founders of the Ocean Heroes Boot Camp, is one of the most amazing organization I have ever worked with and I am and since attending the boot camp, I have been lucky enough to be a squad leader for four boot camps across 2020 and 2021, as well as becoming an ambassador and a part of the design team for Captain Planet's new initiative, the Planetary Alliance. With all these incredible experiences and many more that I didn't have time to mention, I was finally able to reach my goal of running school talk programs in 2018. Growing up with mum being a teacher and working in education since year five myself, I am very passionate about the power of education. I strongly believe that through education, we will be able to solve the issues of climate change, plastic pollution, decreasing biodiversity, etc. As without them knowing that there is a problem, you can't solve them. Education and knowledge are so powerful and opening doors for us. So Mel and I began running a school talk program on the Northern Beaches. As I wished I had a mentor when I was beginning, instead of facing so many challenges due to my age, we now aim to inspire and empower young people to believe they can make a tangible change in the community, no matter their age, whilst also providing them with the skills and education needed to make a change and feel confident in their abilities. We've now presented at schools globally, and some of our recent talks included plastic pollution, eco footprints and how to lower our carbon footprint as individuals and as a school. This program is the highlight of my work with Seas of Change and I'm so excited to continue into the future and expand across Australia. Now to wrap up the past few years, we signed our first official partnership with the Urbis Foundation and they've loved working together on mentoring and education programs. We have all had the joy of working with the pop movement, presenting at their festivals, receiving numerous awards, and I was lucky enough to be a guest mentor for a few of their programs. I was even named an honorary ocean ambassador for the pop movement. We have also started up a podcast series called Ocean Views, where we interview other young leaders in this space to share their journey and learnings to hopefully inspire others to follow. We were also the lucky recipients of the $1,000 grant from Heal the Planet. After working in this industry for seven or eight years now, 2021 was also a very big year as we were able to receive so many awards. For me, it was not about the prestige of the award or having some tidy. It was the fact that after working for so long and only really having people see me as kind of successful in year nine or 10, the awards were so special as an outside body had recognized the work that I was doing, that our whole team was doing with Seeds of Change and other organizations, and that meant the world to me. As a result of the awards, I was also taken so much more seriously and had the opportunity to film with journalists, you know, the Northern Beaches Council, and the New South Wales Department of Education to share the work that Seeds of Change does. Now, before I wrap up, I had some of my colleagues and friends write a list of questions they thought I should answer. So I'm going to go ahead and answer those before I get to everyone else's questions to answer the frequently asked questions. So firstly, the most commonly asked question I get is what does the future look like for seeds of change? This is probably my least favorite question because I often, I don't know the answer. A lot of times I'll sit there and make up saying on the spot, but I really, I don't know. Whilst I have planned everything in my life to the ground, asked my parents from like age two, I knew exactly what I was doing. 
I have actually never planned anything for Seas of Change. I love that this is some magical passion project that I get to work on every day and it gets to involve right in front of my eyes. I've never planned for any of the opportunities I've received and I really couldn't have ever planned for any of those experiences and it's truly the most wonderful thing. Having said that, I've always had dreams for it. The School Talks program is my favourite aspect and I hope to be able to expand it across Australia and internationally in the near future whilst also running workshops. Now that we have all graduated, we are so excited to expand to a greater number of animals and causes, so stay tuned for that. Some of us are also moving out of home, we're all studying different degrees at different unis, so that will be a big challenge, but I'm looking forward to seeing it, where it takes us and who we can collaborate with next. The only thing I can promise you when we're looking to the future is that Caesar Change is not going away anytime soon. It brings me so much joy and I am not passing off that anytime soon. One of the other questions I get asked is how I find motivation and how I stay committed. I admit it's not always easy. People are nasty, people want to cut you down. There are wins politically, but there are also major losses. So it's definitely not the easiest. What I always say to young people is that when you are doing something out of love, it's a lot easier to persevere when times are challenging because you can always come back to your why. For me, I'm also so lucky because I have this amazing team behind me. We get to share the load together and we have our different perspectives and we get to learn from each other and it's just so much fun. And another thing that makes all the tears and hard work and the sleepless nights so worth it is seeing the kids' faces at school talks. They light up, they ask us so many questions and it's just the most amazing experience being able to make such a difference in their lives by just encouraging them and inspiring them. And finally, the last frequently asked question was what challenge did I face and how I overcome them? For me, I started at 10, so one of my big challenges has been just my age. Um, this is something that I have, cannot change, but I've never claimed to have a university degree. I've never claimed to be an expert. I'm only ever relaying the science and making it easier for a younger audience to access and to understand. But as always, there are plenty of keyboard warriors. When I spoke at the Northern Beaches Council meeting in support of declaring a climate emergency, bringing the audience to tears and receiving a standing ovation, might I add, there were a few articles written about the success of the motion and my speech. But in the comments and on social media, plenty of people who were mainly white middle-aged men took it upon themselves to tell me I was ugly, dumb, uneducated, the list goes on. This upset me. I'd never really experienced this before and they were pretty rude and unnecessary. Um, but the way that I was able to overcome that challenge, I guess, was I was kind of proud that, you know, as a 16 year old, I had sat down and spoken for three minutes and it was that provocative that I had people stop and think and they had to say something about it. And I guess the way I think about it is just maybe, maybe it's planted a seed for them to reconsider or to educate themselves in the future. And I consider that a win. So those were my frequently asked questions and my spiel. And now it's time for your questions. I know some were pre-submitted, so I'm excited to read those, but also feel free to add your questions to the chat. It's been an absolute joy sharing my story with you all, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity to participate in the PIT dialogue. If you would like to reach out to us, um, my information is on the slide, so you can contact us on our website, emails, Instagram, whatever. But I'm looking forward to hearing your questions and hearing from you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. And uh, can I uh, assure you that those same um, uh, gentlemen or uh, people who attack you attack me as well so uh, you're uh, you're in bad company if you're being attacked by the same people as me um can i um can i start by asking you a couple of questions and steph's right if you've got any questions the chat feature is open so please just put in them there um and there have been some pre-submitted ones as well so i uh, will get to them too um steph when you when you face like conflicting scientific information and scientific opinion um or not opinion but um conclusions based uh, people reach different conclusions based on the same data how do you how do you handle that generally is there is there a go-to person you have or 
Um, oh. you'll find that oftentimes, like with climate change, my of can scientists say it's real kind of thing. So oftentimes there's not a lot of, there's not heaps of conflicting information. There's always a majority oftentimes. I also have a lot of friends who are my colleagues and they're scientists and they do their own research and they're all like very active in the science space. So I also get to talk to them as well and ask them what they think. Um, but yeah, I think I've never really had a big issue with finding the majority of people. Fair enough. Can I also say, as someone who seems so clearly interested and engaged by science, how upsetting it is for me that you're doing law? <laughs> <laughs> it's a passion project. I never want it to have to make me money, you know? Oh, I want it to be a enough. passion project. And I'm really excited to do law and be able to help people in like a different aspect as well. A bit like when I was younger playing golf. I get it. Totally. <laughs> um, all right. First question. How do you cope, um, and you did mention this in your presentation, how do you cope with negative feedback from people who are not, um, you know, as aware and up to date on the topic as, as a lot of the people you're talking to? Um, like the first thing is I don't read the comments. Right. Um, yeah, I learnt my lesson the first time. You don't read them anymore. Um, but the other thing is you try to educate people. Some people, you know, if there's 99 if they're 99% certain, there's just that 1% that could change. But some people are, you know, 100% certain that they're correct. And sometimes, you know, there's a lot of people in the world and sometimes you can put your energy into a space that might be more successful as well. Um, but I think the way I think about it is, you know, if they had to say something to me, if, you know, it's really made them think and it's at least planted that seed, was I guess how I think about it now. And like maybe they will educate one themselves one day, or maybe they might have listened and learned a little thing from what I said. There's a um, a famous Australian uh, comedian whose name I've embarrassingly forgotten, but who's one of whose characters is Damien Edna Everidge, who always says, "Never let your enemies dwell rent free in your head." I've always liked that. I, I didn't really understand that comment until I got involved in public life. So yeah. uh, maybe that'll help. Um, Okay, this is this is like a competition. How many animals have you saved in your lifetime? Oh my gosh, I get asked this question all the time at school talks. And the answer is, I have no idea. I'm so sorry. That's a disappointing right. answer. Um, all but, right. what, what, you know, what, is the, what is the cutest animal you've saved? Um, look, I love dugons. Not everyone agrees with me that they're very cute. <laughs> but I think they're very cute. Um, so with the health checks, I don't know if you'd say we saved them, but, you know, we've been doing these health checks to check that they're healthy, but also they're super duper under research. So being able to collect data on dugons then means that we can save them in the future and be able to help them. But then also we've been lucky enough to work with the Australian Seabird Rescue on the Central Coast. So um, all of the team, we've all been lucky enough to like meet all of these turtles that have been rescued and go to their releases as well, which is really special. Um, so I think like one thing that you can take away from the Australian Seabird Rescue is don't use balloons. Um, we've had turtles, I was lucky enough to meet this turtle called Ella and Ella actually managed to pull out a balloon string that was four times her body like length. So that was something that, um, you know, to take away, let's not use balloons because um, she got very, very sick from that, but she was lucky enough to survive. That's, great. That's a great story. Um, what What is the ickiest animal you've ever had to save? I don't know if I've had to save any of the icky animals, but I used to, when I was an Ocean Youth Ambassador, I would volunteer with guest experience at the aquariums and preparing the food for the fishes and the penguins and the seals was a little bit gross and it smelled Ugh. really, really bad. Yeah, eels. Ugh. Um, anyway, <laughs> the scariest animal in the world for me is crocodiles. I don't, yeah. I don't, they freak me out. Anyway, um, uh, what has been your favourite opportunity so far? Um, I guess I kind of have like three Sorry. categories of favourite opportunities in the sense that like the do on health checks with Dr. Lenyon, um, I've been raising funds for her since I was 10 and it was a, when you turn 15, you can come with me basically. So I think for me, that was this massive turning point as it was like the first big thing. Like I'd finally been able to do something I've been waiting for for five years. Um, and then another really special thing was when I was able to speak at the North Beaches Council for the Climate Declaration. Um, it was just amazing 
it was like this moment of realization of how powerful youth voices are. I think sometimes um, youth might not realize how powerful their voices are or might feel that they're not always heard. But um, being able to do that and seeing just how powerful youth voices are in like all aspects of life was really special. And then I guess my favorite thing that I do is run the school talks with my best friends. I love, I love education uh, and I get to do it with my mates. So it's the best thing ever. Okay, oh, that's great. Um, and thinking locally, where where we are now on the northern beaches, what what do you think are the is the major issue environmentally, and what what do you think is the most urgent? It might be the same, but I just I know there's sometimes a difference. Yeah, um, I think everywhere, like anywhere in the world right now, the most urgent issue is climate change because you'll find that a lot of things feed into it, like plastic pollution feeds into climate change because plastics are made of oil. Um, so I'd say that climate change is probably the biggest issue, the most urgent issue um, anywhere in the world, but especially in Australia, like if we think about Australia, climate change means like higher temperatures, more extreme weather conditions, more extreme natural disasters, you know, droughts, floods, um, you know, the bushfires we had, everything, and also rising sea levels, which will definitely be affecting the Northern Beaches community. Um, but also, I think if we're just thinking locally, as in Australia, um, climate change has been, I guess, really upsetting to watch the coral bleaching happen in the Great Barrier Reef, which is caused by climate change with the rise in temperatures. So coral reefs are like, <coughs> super important to fish ecosystems. Coral reefs are the most important thing for baby fishes. Like most young fish will spend their life in the coral reefs. So watching that um, all die and also seeing that habitat disappear was, I think, one of the biggest issues in Australia with climate change. I think that's at least the most publicised. Okay. Um, so Abby asks, there seems to be so many environmental issues which are complex, like climate change or farming irrigation runoff to the ocean. Do you recommend we research them each ourselves to a deep level or is it okay to generally take the same position a trusted voice like yourself takes on that issue. I can't find the time myself to do deep research, but I know there these issues are important. Thank you for your answer in advance. So. Um, that is a great question. So what I do, I've obviously had a really long time to do my research and get educated, but like we're never going to be um, as educated as possible. And it's always a process, you know, um, living is learning. Um, but I think, what I do, like if it's a new thing, especially, and I don't have time to learn of it, I'm going to see what my colleagues think, what the you know top environmentalists think. Um, there's, you know, you can Google things online. There are definitely websites that are better than others, that are more reliable than others. I think in Australia, I really like reading The Guardian. Um, it's always got like well-sourced information and it's a starting point to then start off your, your next research kind of thing. Um, so I would say like, if you're completely new to this, you know, um, the other thing is like, if you don't know enough, it's totally okay to say, I don't know enough to have an opinion. And I've said that before, like, if you don't know enough to have an opinion, like that's totally okay. And you can just say, like, I'm, I'm getting educated, but I don't feel confident to have an opinion right now. And I feel like that is way, like, it says so much more about you saying that than just having an opinion that maybe you might not stand by or you don't understand. Um, what's behind that um, but yeah I think taking the opinion or reading a bunch of opinions of like other people who are in the industry and then taking um, from there and then when you do have time being able to research from there. Okay um, what, what's the most difficult topic you've had to get your head around so far? Um, there, I don't know there's been some difficult ones and I think also when you're talking about environmentalism, it's not just environmentalism. There's so many other um, like streams of activism that feed right into it. So it can get a little bit confusing and constantly learning. I think the thing for me that like, it's not necessarily the most complicated topic, but working out how to explain climate change and what it is and why it's not just weather to younger kids was probably um, kind of quite hard because you know, they're very young. Like, I think the hardest thing is always taking it in, you know, talking to your sixes is very different to talking to your one. So taking the language and the knowledge and bringing it down to their level is probably the hardest thing. I can't think of the top of the head of my head what I found the hardest to understand. 
but I think you know you just read a lot of different things and eventually you understand it and talk to other people like I know there's so many people online who do an amazing job um sharing things online and educating but um like you know no one's gonna buy it. like you can actually just message people on Instagram you can email them they're not going to say anything like they people like it when you reach out to them and say like oh I don't really understand this could you explain this to me or I want to do this and I'm not really sure how to do you know how or can you point me in the right direction and honestly a lot of young people wish that someone had pointed them in the right direction when they started so they would love to connect with you and share their knowledge with you as well so you can always just reach out. That's a good point. Um, how do you cope? Uh, sorry, this is a question from Neve. How do you cope with managing your organisation and, um, I guess, previously schoolwork and now university work at the same time? Yes. Well, hi, Neve. So great to see you. Neve actually writes blog posts for us sometimes, which is really exciting. Um, he lives in India at the moment, so it's great to have blog posts from him. Um, so I think, look, it was really difficult to do. Uh, I'm not saying that I was always the best at balancing them 50-50. Some weeks I was definitely doing a lot more secret change work and some weeks I was definitely doing a lot more school work. I know I had one really hectic week where I was in the Department of Education. I was running a boot camp online and I was speaking at three different events. And that week, not much school work got done. Um, but not every week looks like that and you kind of have to just plan in advance and get your stuff done when you can and really sit down and be focused. And also, I was really lucky at my school at Manly. It was just amazing. They were so, so supportive and they were really understanding and would help me to like be able to get my stuff done, but also be really understanding if I needed like two days extra to submit an assignment because I'd been away at a speaking at an event or something. But I think it's just about organization. I know everyone I work with, they say the same thing. It's just about organization. Some people that I work with, they have like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are uh, school days and Thursday and Friday are like working days. Um, but like, or some people just have like a calendar that's like down to the five minute mark and it's like so, so organized. It kind of depends what works for you. But I think for me, it was just knowing what I have each week, knowing what I had to do for school, knowing what I had to do for work and just trying to fit it all in. It's a juggling act, but it's totally, totally possible. Um. And my, my last question for you is this, which is in when it comes to climate change and managing the transition to net zero by 2050, do you how, how, what role do you see economic and economic theory playing in that transition versus just pure the pure science? Um, well, first of all, I'm not an economist, but I do love economics. Um, oh, don't worry. Yeah. If many people who aren't economists claim to be economists. It's okay. Just... <laughs> okay. No, I am not an economist. Um, but yeah, I did study economics and loved it. So I completely understand how it all mixed together. Um, but I think, as I said before, climate change isn't just about science and not just about environmentalism. It's not just about activists. You have to bring in all of these different communities and different works. So, you know, we also need to have an economy and we also need to be making money to live. But we also need to be thinking about the workers and also the First Nations people and what the impact is on the environment. And I guess it is a juggling act in having everything balanced out. Um, but I do think that it is very much possible. I think that there are definitely technologies already out. It is definitely possible to be aiming for 2050 or even 2030. Um, but to get to net zero by then, I think um, in the long term, with the um, economy of you know renewable um, energy and all of that, it will be more beneficial in the long term as well. When we think about how long it's going to be lasting and the expenses, but I think the main thing is that we're doing it in a way that is really good for the environment. But we're also keeping in mind people who maybe work in fields that are going to be affected and having that really good transition from where they are to a different job or to something else, so that they're not feeling left behind or anything because I think you know being without a job is one of the worst things and so I would like hate for that so I think for the government and looking at all of that trying to balance that I understand it's very hard but other countries have done it and I think it is totally possible to balance both the, the environmental side and the economics by you know looking at people's wages and working where people can you know where can else can people be working with those skill sets but also be just 
you know, in the long term, it's going to be benefiting the economy a lot more. Yeah, the amazing thing about Australia is, and I totally agree with you, I think we'll get to net zero a long time before 2050, just the way the technology is playing out. But the thing about our net zero plan, which I think a lot of people don't realise, is that it's mostly an economic document with all these opportunities for increasing jobs and bringing industry to Australia and a whole bunch of stuff that will really be um, fantastic for both this generation and the generation to follow. So um, I'm glad you, I'm, I'm glad you sort of talk about that. That's really good. Um, look, we've got uh, we've got two minutes left. Do you have any questions yourself? <laughs> I don't. Sorry. <laughs> wow. Then um, for the first time in history, uh, I will be um, ahead of time, which is fantastic news. Um, Steph, can I thank you so much for coming on today? It, it's really been fascinating. It's so refreshing to see um, someone like yourself getting engaged in these issues, really being passionate about it and both encouraging and, and not only that, but inspiring other people to also get engaged in them too. And the, um, I've got to say, and this is probably, um, please don't hold it against me, but the, the most refreshing thing about your presentation was that you're not afraid to say, I don't know, but I, I'm happy to find out. Um, I think too many people in too um, much of our public debate um, are too afraid to admit they don't know the answer to something. So I, I really, um, I think that takes real strength. So thank you very much for doing that and showing us the way on that too. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, can, uh, can all of you please give uh, Steph a clap? Um, you're all on mute, so don't worry. Uh, but, uh, the, the pause was deafening. Um, so thank you, Steph, and I really appreciate it. And if there's anything we can do, please just reach out. We'd love to help. Will do. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. See ya.